gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia here with another illustration video. I know that um, a couple weeks ago I was in Arizona and I have I am I have a good number of insects that were collected on my spreading boards and on the pinning boards, but a lot of them are not they're too big and they're not exactly dry yet and I don't want to take them off of the boards until they're ready this one though was mostly was is dry so I felt comfortable pulling pulling her off um, this is a western rhinoceros beetle I collected her um, on a peak in Gardner Canyon um, Gardner Canyon is one of the sky islands in Arizona so in Arizona, there are a number of canyons that are, um, funny enough, they call them canyons, but they are pretty high in elevation. The um, environment in those is very different than, um, like, the ground level around Tucson. Uh, you go up six, seven, eight thousand feet in elevation, and the temperature completely changes, and the insect populations completely change. So, this western rhinoceros beetle was collected up at Gardner Canyon. Um, I also was collecting or got and got to see insects on Box Canyon and Madera Canyon. So, um, they're cool places and I absolutely love them. Welcome, Susan. Now, um, this rhinoceros beetle is female, unfortunately, so she does not have a horn. Um, the, uh, this species of rhinoceros beetle generally just has, on the male, just has one horn right here in the center of her head. When these rhinoceros beetles started flying in, I got all excited because I was hoping a male that would come in because there were so many females out there. But, um, it didn't happen. <clears throat> yes, exactly, Susan. Sky Islands, because they are isolated patches. Um... And they have unique insects that you can't find pretty much anywhere else. Um, and Madeira Canyon is close enough to um, Madeira Canyon is close enough to the Me to um, the Mexican border that uh, you could almost say that some of these canyons kind of funnel more tropical insects up to um, uh, up into southern Arizona. Um, yes, but they're super cool and they're awesome to collect in and around. Um, so I do have the species name on this beetle here. I'm going to start with its common name, the Western. I'm just going to write Rhino Beetle to shorten the, the, to shorten its name a little bit. Greetings, Deb! Uh, the species name on this beetle is Xylorictes thestalis. It's going to be, um, there are, I think, multiple species of Xylorictes in Arizona, but thestalis is the most common one. I will admit that I'm not exactly sure what the characteristics are that differentiate this Xylorictes, the, the Stalus, from the other species, but I did do a little bit of, like, picture ID, you know, cross-comparing cross the different individuals, and I believe it's the common species. Dallas. And maybe one day I will collect a male rhinoceros beetle or Hercules beetle. Um, my students are always teasing me because I tell them, you know, I have Hercules beetles and rhinoceros beetles and then the ones that I show them never have horns because um, I have only ever collected the females. I've collected one eastern Hercules beetle that had a horn once, but he is no longer in my collection, so sad day. Going to continue looking out for him. Um, as we are going through and looking at this specimen, um, I can actually, I can um, give you, I can show you the characteristics that make it a scarab beetle. Um, 
Uh, but then after Scarabs, there's just something about its body shape that um, tells me that it's a Dynastine. But um, that's a hard one to put my finger on. Alrighty. So let's see. I'm going to go ahead and take a picture of it where it is and then pull our specimen over. Doop, doop, doop. Here she is. Um, she is essentially just a large black beetle. Now, um, when these females were flying into my black light, they were so loud. Um, I love hearing them fly in. And the beetles were coming in really, really heavy. Um, I, uh, I think that I would have gotten males if I stayed there all night, like if I stayed there later. Uh, I did leave the, uh, I left the canyon a little earlier than I wanted to, but, um, it was out of, it was, it was for safety stuff. So, let's see. This specimen, from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen, uh, this specimen from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen is about 3.8 centimeters. It's about 3.8 centimeters, so it's a fairly large beetle. The image that you are seeing underneath the microscope over there is um, as far out as I can get, so that's as zoomed out as I can. Um, so we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be sketching it. I think we'll sketch it dorsally. There's a part of me that wants to kind of sketch it from a. A lateral point of view. Let me go ahead and show that to you really quick. Its eyes are beautiful. Maybe we will do that. Maybe we'll sketch it from a lateral point of view. Oh. We just have to be nice and careful. When I put these insects on their sides, sometimes, there we go, this, uh, this beetle's actually heavier than the styrofoam that it's on, so it tried to tip it over. Silly beetle! And from a lateral point of view, um, you can see that she has that little lip up in the front near her pronotum. That's kind of cool. Let's draw from a lateral point of view. Alright, I'm going to turn my paper sideways. Well, she's so cute. I also really want to turn her head and look at the mouth parts a little bit, because I believe that there was something crazy happening over there. But, um... I have the legs positioned nicely for this direction, too, so we're just going to sketch her from this way. Um, I'm going to grab a paintbrush. You see, she does have a little bit of hair there in front of her, so sometimes I can use a paintbrush to clean the specimens just a little bit so that we don't have to worry about that through the rest of our drawing. So, uh, you, as you all know, I like to start my sketches with a light outline and then zoom in and go back and, um, kind of finalize some of the lines and look at some more fine details. I'm really excited about zooming in on the compound eye of this, of this beetle because I think that it's gonna be gorgeous. It looks all pretty in gold, so I'm excited about it. Um... All right. Uh, for the head, just as kind of a starting shape to get some of our measurements down and to get some of our ratios started, um, I'm going to go ahead and create kind of a um, an elongated D shape, but I'm going to make sure that that head stays nice and um, 
stays nice and short because that pronotum, that next body part, is really, really tall. And I will admit, I'm not going to be adding some of those extra um, kind of arches in there until we um, until we zoom in and check it out. But um, if you go up from the bottom just a little bit, that's kind of where the pronotum is going to be connected. So let's see. I'm going to go up. And then our pronotum is, let's see, I can actually go ahead and do this really quick. And this is as far out, let's see. Point nine, point four five. Okay, so um, the uh, the height of the pronotum is about double the height of the head. So if you take your head height, I think my pronotum got just a little bit too tall. If you take the height of your head and you multiply that by two, that is about as tall as your pronotum is going to be. And so I'm going to create just this arch that comes up, and then I'm going to swoop it down. I want to make sure that this is nice and round here, because you can see uh, from our from our guy, this isn't really angulate or um, or doesn't have any kind of sharp corners or anything like that. Although we are going to have the bottom of the first segment of the throat thorax, we could almost call it the prosternum, possibly. Yeah, um, and so we're going to take from right around here, and we're going to give it that additional little piece down here. That's where the leg is going to be connected, the bottom of the, the bottom of the body, so we're going to leave that there. And then we're going to scooch, scooch on over so that we can see some more of these, uh, some more of the elytra. Uh, what I want to do is... What I want to do is align this line here, that where that edge of that pronotum is, with the edge of the elytra. So if you were to take this line here, you're going to go all the way down, and that's going to be kind of where your elytra are. And then the abdomen is actually going to be dropped down a little bit lower than that. So if you go from the very top of the body, you can see that the top of the elytra match up about right with the uh, with the top of the pronotum. So I'm going to create this little ledge here, and then I'm um, going to come on up. Um, our elytra do you want it to line up with here, but you don't want it to have that corner. So you can come here and kind of round it on down. Um, and then the real, the real question is going to be exactly how long do we make the elytra? Um, let me go ahead and just pull my ruler and see what that looks like. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the elytra is about double the length of the head and the pronotum combined. So if you take this... Um, I'm going to give you some, some estimates over here. It was about 1.2 centimeters here and about 2.4 here. So it was about double. Let me double check that. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Alrighty. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take this measurement here, go one, I'm going to make the head less pointy because I don't want it to add to my, my measurement. That feels very long. Oh, you know what? That's because that measurement includes the end of the abdomen. We're going to go just a little bit shorter than that. 
So this point here that is double is also going to include the abdomen. And I'll go ahead and scooch our specimen over so that you can see this. At the very end of our specimen, the elytra end, those first hard wing shells end. And then you have this additional abdominal region here that comes out. He's so fluffy. So this is going to be essentially my outline for my body shape for for this um, for this western rhino beetle. Uh, when I went out to Arizona, it hadn't really started raining yet, and this was, this beetle came out two days after the first rainstorm of the monsoon season, so the, a lot of the beetles are going to be triggered by the rains out there in the desert. They don't want to come out when it's dry and there's nothing to eat. They want to wait for it to rain and for the plants to have to leaf out before they emerge. And so when these beetle, when it rains really hard the first time, these beetles come out in number, in large numbers. Um, many times in the insect world, I'm not sure if this pertains exactly to rhinoceros beetles, but many times in the insect world, the males will emerge first and then the females emerge after. Um, so I know this is true for a small parasitoid wasp I used to work for. It was pretty much exactly 18 days for the males and 21 days for the females in our rearing um, enclosures. And so a lot of times the males will come out first in the insect world so that um, they're essentially ready for the females when they emerge. Because if the females were to emerge first and there weren't any males, they are wasting time. Um, when you're talking about population dynamics, it's the females that really drive the growth of, um, of uh, populations. Hi, Hashi! Welcome! We're looking at a western rhinoceros beetle, although she is female, so she is, no, she has no horn. Um, but we are just about ready to start zooming in and checking out some features. So let's go ahead and zoom in on this head. Um, I know that some of us out there really like the compound eyes, and I'm excited about them. So let's see what they look like. They're just so sparkly. We're going to zoom in on them. Look at how gorgeous. It just looks like a little golden, like, it just looks so golden. Especially in comparison to the rest of the head. So pretty. Okay, that's enough of the eye. Oops. Trying to get a perfect uh, lateral view of this head so that our uh, our sketch is accurate. That is pretty good. I love the golden eyes of this um, of this scarab, and it truly is gold. That is not a um, that's not a camera flare or some type of weird lighting situation. In real life, those uh, compound eyes uh, look like a piece of gold. Um, 
Why is the eye so low? It's on the lateral of the head. I couldn't give you an answer as to why it's so low. It's just not high on the head. Um, All right, so when we're looking at our compound eye here, um, this point here where the pronotum comes, the eye armor reminds me of a medieval horse armor. Oh, cool. I love it. Um, let's see. I'm going to darken. I'm going to bring my line for my head up just a little bit to give a little bit of room um, to the right a little bit to give a little bit of room for that um, space in between the head and the pronotum. And let's see. I don't know where I want to start on this one. Maybe what I'll do is I will start the shaping on the top of the head and then I'll add the compound eye. So the very top of the head, instead of it just being this very natural like full arch all the way down, there's the first, I guess, quarter of the top of the head is fairly flat and then it's going to come down a little bit. And then you see right about here where uh, this female just has a little itty bitty bit of a bump there. That's where the male is going to have the horn. So if I was drawing the male's head, it would look something like this where it comes down like that. But then the horn is actually as tall as the pronotum and then comes down and it finishes his mouth parts. So that's going to be what the male looks like. Our female just has this kind of little itty bitty um, bump on the front. She's like, I want to, I wish I had a horn. Um, and so then the front of our mouth comes out like this. And I do want to zoom into some of those mouth parts and see if we can get some more of those details in. Okay. So from the very front, this is going to be, I don't see the, I don't see the labrum, the upper lip. What I see is the clippius. This is essentially the part of the head that connects to the upper lip. Um, but there is no break in the exoskeleton. So this kind of comes up and you have that clippius region here. Um, then you can see all of those little seedy or those little insect hairs right here. Um, insects a lot of times are going to have little hairs in and around their mouths for kind of like uptake. Um, rhinoceros beetles are the same. They do as adults. As adults, I believe they're going to be eating sugary, yummy things. So they're going to be either nibbling on little bits of nectar or finding fruiting bodies and, and chewing on that, I believe. I would, have to, I would have to Google them a little bit. But I believe they mostly focus on sugary liquids as adults rather than chewing on leaves or wood. Um, this next... This next piece here comes down and around. That's the mandible right here. And it's below a good amount of hair. She looks like she's smiling. Yeah, she does. So we've got all of this hair here. And then the mandible starts from up here and kind of comes through. And it's nice and sharp and it makes this kind of rounded this rounded triangular piece here. Let's see if I can get you closer. Right around here. So that's going to be our mandible. And that is a segmented piece. So you can come on back here and you can kind of finish that triangle too on the back because there is, it's a little bit difficult to see that line um, way back here in the base, but I promise that it does exist right around here. Uh, then We've got some more hairs down here, and we've got mouth fingers, right? These are our labial. These, this one right here is a labial pulp. They're mm, maxillary. 
This one right here is the maxillary pelp. It exists right underneath the mandibles. And then there should be another set of pelps that's underneath. Um, that we are not seeing right now. It's just not like positioned properly to see the bottom mouth fingers. Because I've got the ones on the sides and then the ones that are kind of on the bottom. So it looks like they're three segmented from what we can see from the base here. And they go out further than those mandibles. So one, two, three. And then that labrum, that bottom jaw, is going to pull it on back. Oh, look how cute it is. Okay. So that's right about where that is. And then I'm going to be pulling this back just a little bit. And I do want to add the, um, I do want to add the antenna coming out in this direction, I believe. So let's go ahead and add the antenna and then I'm going to add the compound eye. A lot of times I start with the eye, but today I kind of wanted to start from the front back. So this is what our antenna looks like. Um, as you know, we do have a couple of words for antenna parts. There is the scape, the pedicel, and the flagellum. Uh, just depending on what segment of the antenna you're looking at, the first one is the scape, the second one is the pedicel, and all of the other ones are the flagellum. Um, so this first one right here, this scape, is connected right behind that mandible here and is kind of a wider round segment here, fairly large. The pedestal is really tiny. It's like this itty bitty little oval segment connected to it. And then we've got a number of oval segments. Let's see if we can count them. One. Oh, you're tricky. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm going to say, depending on if there are two little segments up here that I can't see or one, there are either ten or eleven segments. I'm having a lot harder time counting them. But I can tell you that this is what we would consider a, uh, a clubbed antenna. Um, and having clubbed antenna are one of those characteristics that help you identify scarabs. In fact, um, a clubbed antenna with a three-segmented club um, is going to be characteristic of this family. There are other families of beetles that have three-segmented clubs, but this is kind of one of those characteristics we look for. Um, a lot of times the clubbed antenna on, um, a lot of times the clubbed antenna on scarabs are also what we call lamellet. That just means that they have the ability to open and close kind of like this. They have like extra muscles in their, in their antenna that not only help them kind of move around, but they help them open. So if you see here, the last, seg the last three segments, one, two, three, make up this entire club. They're connected to the antenna down here, and these three open like this. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the club, seven, eight, ten. little tricky. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build the club 
together and then I'm going to put the lines to divide it. I'm going to do that one more time. That works for me. All right, so we have the mandibles and we have this antenna club. And if we were going to take this and make it a little bit bigger, it would look something like this where that first segment is kind of larger and square. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then the three that are connected, which looks like eight, nine, Something along those lines. Does the club have a serrated inner edge? That is a great question. What you're looking at that looks serrated are actually hairs. They are very, very tiny hairs. And they're almost, they're like, a, hmm, you're, uh, it, it's difficult to get enough light on them to see them, but the hairs are in rows down the length. So if I was going to zoom in right here, um, and I was just going to draw the edge of the antenna, there's hairs that do this. It's like they're very short hairs, but then they are also, they also come kind of in rows, which is kind of cool. The other side of the antenna also has hairs, uh, but the other side, if you're looking at this side, um, the hairs are a lot more irregular and they're just there's just kind of a couple of them, rather there being this like so many kind of comb shape, or uh, yeah. I'm not sure what those hairs would be used for. They are cool. Alrighty, so now all we have to do is add this and uh, add this compound eye here. Um, how I'm going to do it is because you've got those pieces of the exoskeleton coming from the front and the back. I'm going to go ahead and do the top half of the eye and then the bottom half of the eye. And then the edge of the, the edge of the head kind of comes in right here at that middle of the eye. It's so pretty. I needed to make the edge on the front just a little bit steeper, so I went ahead, erased it, and tried that one more time. And I am going to go ahead and crosshatch within the compound eye so we know that that's what it is. All right, do we have any more questions about the head before we move on? And I can turn her sideways so that we can look at her head on almost and see if there's any other cool features. Okay, see this is, this is fun. Wait a minute. The mandibles from the side look very triangular like any other chewing mouth parts, but the mandibles from the top 
are very square. Alright, so this is looking at that mouth part from, um, from a dorsal point of view or from the head. And you can see those big kind of square looking guys over off to the side. Those are the mouth, those are the mandibles, those are the chewing mouth parts. Um, and then you can see both the maxillary and the labial palps. So this one right here on the outer edge is going to be connected to the maxilla. So this is the maxillary. And then that little guy right there, that's a labial palp. And they're probably right on top of each other when you look at them from the side, which is why you can only see one. Um, and I love her little mustache. All of those cute little orange hairs right there, I think they're adorable. Um, the, uh, what you're seeing down there a little bit further, those are the uh, front pair of legs that are just pulled up close to her head. If anybody was seeing those and wondering what those were, right there, those are her legs. Um, it's just playing a little bit of a depth perception game with you. How much control do they have over the, the antenna and does it... Do they have muscles inside the antenna? Yes. So they do have muscles inside of the antenna to help them move those antenna around. Um, and a lot of times those antenna muscles, a lot of times those antenna muscles just kind of move their, move insect antenna like this. But it takes special muscles and more, it, t it takes a different set of muscles to not only kind of move your antenna around, but to open and close those antenna. So it takes one set of muscles essentially to move them around and then another set to open and to close. How much control do they have over their antenna? Um, well, everything is going to vary by species. Uh, but there are some scarabs that have lamellate antenna that are more than three segments. There's some scarabs that have these crazy lamellate antenna that have all of these pieces and they can open and close them like this very readily. Um, those antenna are really good at sensing pheromones and so uh, a lot of times you'll see them kind of open and splayed like that when they are looking for their partners but then they'll kind of close them and tuck them away when they are when they're not. <laughs> So, our specimen um, does have punctations. You can see all those little dots along the pronotum. Um, is just a little bit of a, of a flare on the exoskeleton. I had somebody ask me one time if those punctations were to help during flight, and I still would love an answer to that. Um, I regularly think about it because somebody compared them to like a, a golf ball and the divots on a golf ball helping the golf balls to fly. Something about air currents and frictions and stuff. Um, and I would still love an answer to that question. There are no simple eyes. Exactly. Yes, is splaying them open to increase surface area. That's exactly what it is. So um, they have sensory hairs on, um, and that might be what these are actually. Um, they have sensory hairs on their antenna, and when they're open, there's more surface area and more ability to pick up all of those signals. Whereas when they're closed and kind of tucked away, it's more of a defensive posturing or like a um, or a protect protecting themselves type of posturing. Um, and yes, I've never seen them fly with their antenna open. A lot of times they tuck them for flight and then they open them when they land. Alrighty, so I'm going to pull my, um, I'm going to pull my pronotum down just a little bit 
and we can see that the pronotum does go kind of inward right there at the middle of the eye. So here I'm going to arch it towards the head and back in so that I have this little bit of kind of a drawn out S shape here. And I want to make sure that at this point it does come down pretty hard. That, that sharp point there is actually, if you look at it from a from like a head-on point of view, it is two spines here, one closer to us and one further away from us. We're going to go all the way up to the top up here, but then I'm going to make sure that this isn't as sharp of a corner. I'm going to kind of round it off a little bit. So I'm going to go a little bit past what I planned. And then I'm going to come in and then back out to give a little bit of shaping on this pronotum here. And then once you get to this point, we're just going to round it back. I'm actually pretty happy with the bottom side of my pronotum right about here. Awesome. Now some of you are really great with shading and you'll be able to shade out that divot right there in the front of the pronotum. That is not where my skills lie just yet, so I'm going to leave it as is. Uh, there are a series of hairs here on the, in, on the far side of the pronotum. And let's scooch. Alrighty, so we have this whole region to kind of work with when we are sketching our front leg, and I think that's what we're going to do. We're going to do front to the back. Um, sometimes we wait for legs to be the end, but I want to draw the legs, so let's do this. Um, bloop, bloop, bloop. I'm going to do this light really quick, uh, because this femur pretty low and it comes up Alrighty, so with this femur here, I'm just going, it's, it's more of a vertical shape. She does have excellent legs. And then when we turn her, we're going to see all of these like crazy tibial, um, the, the, she has these wild looking, I want to, they're, she has adaptations on her legs for digging, but they are not really fossorial or digging legs. Just for, like, they aren't really what you would think of when you say fossorial legs, but she does have these like series of spines on the outside of her tibia for doing just that, for digging. So, um, I've got a little bit of the bottom of my first segment of my thorax here and our, the bottom side of the femur stays nice and wide and kind of comes up like so. So let's see. So we've got that femur here and then the tibia is going to be connecting right here at where I kind of left this half circle. I left a little bit of a half circle here and that's where my tibia is going to be connecting to. Um, when we're looking at it from a lateral point of view, the, uh, the, the shaping on the tibia isn't as obvious so I might end up turning her sideways so that you can see some of it. 
but we're going to go ahead and do the top of the tibia from this angle. It's nice and smooth. And it comes down like that. And then the outside does have a series of three spines. Let's go ahead and turn her so you can see. That's her tibia. The outside of it. So we, it actually is almost like four. There's a very minor one. And then they get larger and larger and it's kind of swooped you know it's it's so tricky because it's from a different point of view because the top and the bottom those spines are actually coming out towards the viewer so i'm going to play with a little bit and i'm going to say if this is the top and the bottom of a, the lateral of our friend here Maybe I'll even make it go a little shorter. That feels long. Maybe I will create one, two. Maybe I'll create these V's to show that they are that they are there and coming moving forward. And then the last V is going to be the edge. Still learning too. Where do they lay eggs? I'm wondering if maybe they dig to lay eggs. Um, they definitely dig to get out of their pupil chamber. So their pupil chambers are underground and they do have to dig themselves out as adults. I'm not sure if they dig down to lay their eggs or if they lay their eggs on the top and then their grubs dig down. Not sure about that. I did try to do a little bit of reading on um, these guys before before the live stream and I didn't find as much information as I really wanted to um, about this particular species. Five tarsal segments. Because I know a lot of um, a lot of rhinoceros and Hercules beetles feed on um, rotting wood or or uh, burrow through fallen trees type thing, but the emergence holes for the western rhinoceros beetle are from soil, and so I'm not sure I'm not even sure what the grubs feed on if the if it's some type of something underground or if it's a or if it's wood. I wish I knew. Alright, so we've got five coming out here. They do seem to come out from the bottom side of this guy. So we're going to go one, two, three. I don't know exactly how to describe these tarsal segments because a lot of times I will use like triangle shaped or cone shaped or heart shaped to describe tarsal segments, but these ones are almost just like a series of series of spheres, a series of balls. I don't know how I would describe it. it almost looks like beads on a string. And then the fifth tarsal segment is nice and long with those two claws. And these beetles, when they hold on to you, they hold on tight. They have some serious claws at the end of their tarsi.
Both of those are sitting next to each other, so it might be a little bit trickier to see, but that's what they look like. Kind of want... Sorry, I'm going to erase these and try again. I want them to be more forward and less down towards the viewer. One, two, three, four. That makes me happier. Alright, so we've got a head and we have a pronotum. This is going to be one of those beetles that I think is going to spin on the pin. So that makes me sad. I'm probably going to have to put a little bit of glue on the top or the bottom where the pin touches the specimen because I think it's going to be spinning in the drawer. And that's the worst. So you can see here up at the very top that little triangle is a scutellum. Ah, there it is. Is a scutellum. Um, it exists right here, and it's that lily bee triangle. Um, but we can also see from this point of view that there's a little bit of the uh, of the other elytra that we can see too. Um, so what I'm going to do is come right around here. I do want to. Give myself a little straight line so there is that little bit of separation in between the pronotum and the uh, elytra or the wings. Um, and right about where this touches, that's going to be about the center of this scutellum, of this triangular piece here. So I'm going to come down and add the scutellum first, I believe. Make sure that it's not super pointed, right? It looks kind of nice and roundy. Um, but then right there at the... Hmm, I want it to be... kind of up. Yeah. Wait, this is live. Yes, it is, Caleb. Welcome. What are your thoughts on the insect population decline? That it is happening and that it is incredibly, incredibly sad. Um, I read a paper recently about the insect, uh, I say recently, four years ago, um, four? About four years ago, I read a paper on the insect decline that spoke on which species were in decline and came up with essentially like reasons for those declines and those in those orders and essentially the moral of the story was that every insect order is in decline um, and it's for a huge variety of it's for a huge variety of reasons but um, top on many of the lists were um, uh, were pesticides and uh, destruction of their destruction of their environments just sad so I'm gonna come up here and so right there at that very center of that of that scutellum kind of where that triangle is we're gonna take this line and go all the way vertical and we want to kind of round it down once it gets to the end and then anywhere above that that's the far elytra you don't want it to go too high all right, and then you've got the one that's close. So, I'm actually pretty happy with the with the size of everything. I'm going to go ahead and scooch it this way a little bit so that you can see the edge here. That is nice foreshortening on that so you tell them why, thank you. <laughs> All right, so right around here where the where they meet, I'm going to start bringing it down and coming on back. I shortened the end just a little bit, and I'm going to be adding those hairs here. Um, there are a good number of scarabs that can take the bot, like 
the top of their abdomen and rub it up against the bottom of their wings and make a stridulation, a squeaking sound. But uh, these rhinoceros beetles don't make that sound. I am going to round that edge. You can see that we've got punctations. All of these, oops, come on friend. We do have punctations throughout the pronotum. The pronotum had it had these had these punctations very kind of random, but along this wing, the punctations are in straight lines. So if you were going to add that texturing to your elytra, you can totally do that. She has an impressively big butt. <laughs> Uh, this is true, and you know what? You guys always bring it back to the butts, and so I appreciate that about you all. Um, so let's see. I think that what uh, I think that our next step for our sketch is going to be adding in our legs, the middle and the hind pair of legs. Um, for uh, for scarabs, we've already talked about the fact that they have those lamellate antennae that can open and close, but then in addition, all scarab beetles have six ventrites. Six? Yeah. Six. Um, they have six ventrites, which means that they have um, six abdominal segments. And so if you were trying to compare a scarab to closely related families, um, you want to count abdominal segments. So when we get to that point, we're going to flip her over so that you can see it better. That's true, Susan. I really appreciate that's that's true, true that they um that they are straight, but it can it would definitely help with that 3D-esque look if you were following those lines. For sure. Now, with this front leg here, um, or this middle leg here, something that I do want to point out is that the femur is coming up and the tibia is coming back kind of right on top of each other. So, we might be able to add a little bit of a sliver of the femur, but it's not going to look like much. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it really lightly so that I don't have to erase the whole thing. Um, so coming up from here, we've got a little bit of a line, essentially the same length as that top one here, and then I'm going to bring it down. This is where our femur is going to be connected, right, right about here, and it does go up in this direction. And then the tibia comes back down just slightly off and the tarsal segments are going to be going out that way. So what we can do now is I've got an idea of where our femur is going to be. That's what I'll do sometimes is I'll create these very light kind of um, shapes so that I know where it is and then I know which lines to follow. So our femur is coming up in this direction and then our tibia is coming back down and it has a whole series of absolutely gorgeous hairs and it has these two spurs at the end of it which makes them kind of awesome let's see Alrighty, and then I'm going to go ahead and erase any of these lines inside of the legs that we don't need. So we have the femur coming up, we have the tibia coming back down, and then we've got those tarsal segments, and this got some long tarsal segments. One, two, three, four, five. I do believe scarab beetles have a 555 five, five tarsal formula, but as we're going through, we're counting, so we'll be able to see. Five, five, five. Five, meaning five tarsi on the front leg, five tarsi on the middle leg, and five tarsi on the hind leg. Um, this first tarsal segment is more rectangular than the others. 
And I'm going to make sure that the that these tarsal segments come down towards the viewer just a little bit because I want to make sure that there's enough room for those hind legs and that they don't get in the way. That's what we can do as artists. We can make those decisions. Two. These, um, these tarsal segments are a little trickier for me to sketch because they are... There isn't as much definition in between the segments. Four. And then that fifth one is the nice long one that is more raindrop shaped like other tarsal, like other final tarsal segments. And then you've got the two tarsal claws at the end. Very good, very good. So, Caleb, is there a certain insect species or group that you are um, concerned about for the uh, for the population declines? Um, because, for instance, things like fireflies are in decline. Prime, I would say, primarily for due to the um, I would say primarily due to pests. Uh, pesticides that people put down in their lawns uh, because that's where the immature fireflies are but then also fireflies are additionally competing with each other more regularly because we leave our street lamps on I appreciate the whirl of spines at the end of each tarsal segment. <laughs> yes, and you're right. I mean, I didn't add all of those, all of those, um, those hairs, but there are a whole, um, those ones that are around each tarsal segment. Those are actually hairs. Um, so these ones in here, in between the segments, are hairs, and these ones are spines, made out of actual exoskeleton. Alrighty, now all we have to do is this final leg, and then the abdomen. people. I hope that you're all here and hanging out still. Alrighty. Um, our femur here, we want it to make sure that we are doing kind of the same thing where the femur is coming up in this direction, the tibia pr proceeds back, but on um, the hind leg, the um, where you can see the femur is in front of the tibia rather than behind it. So, if the femur is in this direction, very closely connected, the tibia is going to be coming off of the top here. So what you can see is the front rather than the back is what I was trying to describe. And so we've got that kind of shape here. Regarding fireflies, in some rural areas, I have seen them primarily at the borders between woods and fields. The fields in question do get mowed. Yeah, there are um, there are certain fireflies that will specifically kind of target different different environments, right? So those um, fireflies that exist on those borders between meadows and and forests. You'll see those bordering meadows and forests all around the country. Um, for instance, I think the one, the super common firefly that we have all across at least the eastern U.S. and at least the eastern U.S. is Photinus pyralis, the, um, the J-shaped firefly. And it does exist primarily along the edges of meadows and forests, but then again, you still see them sometimes out in the open, especially in undisturbed environments. 
I do have fireflies, and we can talk a whole bunch about them. So I am okay. Uh, we can definitely do a firefly at some point. I think we have done firefly a uh, firefly in the past, um, but I am more than happy to do another one. Kind of widens at the base, and this one you can see kind of how those two tibial spines Whew, tricky and then the tarsal segments are connected right here in between those You know what's cool is if you mess with the um, the focus on the microscope, I think that it's actually a point of three at the end of the tibia. There's this one here that's very obvious. There's this one here that's obvious and is behind the tarsal segments. And there is one more up here in front of the segments. So it's kind of like a, there's there's three and then the tarsal segments come out from the center. One, two, three, four, five. That is our last fifth. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, and the claws. So I do want to make sure that I, I connect a line in between these two, um, in between these two legs. I'm going to go up a little bit. I don't want to connect them at that very bottom because they do kind of proceed down and then come back up. But then right after this hind leg, this is where the, abdom the abdomen and the abdominal segments are going to start. So I'm just going to create a vertical line right here. And that creates our separation between the thorax and the abdomen. Now, I am just going to go ahead and flip her upside down for a minute so that you can see the ventrites. Alright, so these are the ventrites, spelled V-E-N-T-R-I-T-E-S. Uh, ventrites are the bottom side of the abdomen segments. The segments on the bottom side of the abdomen are called ventrites. Um, and all scarabs have six of them. One, two, three, four, five, six. I count six. Do you? Let's see. You want to start up here? One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, this right here that looks like an additional segment at the end is actually a one of the segments from the top kind of rounding down because when we when we mentioned ventrites we're specifically talking about the the segments that are on the bottom side of the abdomen something that I like to do does she have an ovipositor or other organs at the end that we can see um, <coughs> we'll go ahead and turn her in a moment um, but I believe the answer is going to be no um, the final app 
abdominal segment, right, is really large and plate-like in ladies, though. So you can see here this big piece, that's going to be the last segment, and it's really big and wide. I believe the males is significantly smaller. Um, ovipositor is going to be the right term for any female egg laying device, whether it is um, a beetle or a bee. Um, but, or a butterfly, or a dragonfly. Um, but I don't believe she has any ovipositor or egg laying device. She just kind of opens up the end of her abdomen and pushes one out. Uh, but what I can do is take right about here in between the, in between the leg and the elytra. This is going to be, I'm going to imagine it as like a lateral line, a side line. And I'm going to take it and I'm going to come out to right around here, I think. All right. And then, um, so I've got this very light kind of sideline. And from the bottom here, I'm going to arch the abdomen down. And then from the top here, I want it to go up and then over to the elytra. So now you can see that that's kind of going to help us, and actually I want it to angle up more like this. Um, that's going to help us get a, a better idea kind of where the abdominal segments are. Yeah, exactly. Really like hymenopterans have crazy ovipositors, katydids, crickets, grasshoppers, you can see the ovipositor on. Um, you can see the ovipositor really clearly on, also on things like cicadas. I can't think of any beetles that have a really strong egg laying device like that. Um... It would be cool to see one, though. I can't think of one. I tried. I used my thinking hat. <laughs> All right. Um, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. All right. Six segments here. And right here where we have that middle line, <clears throat> instead of making it stacked like we would for a wasp, I'm just going to take each segment outside of this last one and I'm going to make a little U shape here. Alright, and those are the lines I'm going to darken. So I'm going to do, I am going to do this one at a time. I'm going to add this segment here. And then the next segment, I'm just going to create that little kind of U-shaped line in between each segment. And then this final one up. All right, so we've got those taken care of. There are a series of little CD or little hairs in between the tops and the bottom segments, so you can add those if you'd like. And then these ones are going to be kind of angled towards the head a little bit until you get to this last segment where it's ginormous and is more like this. And then obviously you have all of those fun little hairs that you can add to right here at that lateral line, to here at the, um, the end of the elytra. Oh, I love how she turned out. And obviously you can add all of those punctations. I'm sure that some of you added all of those punctations while I was chatting. Alrighty, so I also have this really, really big, awesome grasshopper, and I really wanted to sketch that with you today from Arizona, um, but it hasn't dried yet. I pinned it a week and a half ago.
Yeah, a week and a half ago, and it still is not dry enough for me to take off of the spreading board. So we are working on it, and over the next couple of weeks, we're definitely going to be mostly focusing on insects that I collected in Arizona, because those are the new ones. Um, and why not focus on the new fun insects? Um, and I can talk to you about where I was when I collected them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty happy. It makes sense you'd see it on cicadas. Exactly. Because they need to be able to pierce into wood. And that's what I was thinking. I, I was trying to think of any beetles that would have a, that would need to actually pierce into something to lay their eggs. And I just can't think of any. There's one beetle that keeps popping into my head, but I don't even know what family it's in. Broadneck root borer. Some of the Prianus longhorn beetles are going to have ovipositors, but I believe most of the time they're kind of retractable ovipositors in comparison to like um, crickets that they can't pull their ovipositor back in. Cool. Awesome sauce. So, I have had a fantastic time sketching and drawing with everybody. Um, if you don't have any additional questions, I'm going to go ahead and switch on over to this right about here. Oh man, my microscope is, my microscope does exist. There, there we go. <laughs> um, all right. I hope that you all have a wonderful week. Uh, keep in mind that if you know anybody who wants to, um, who wants to, who uh, who knows students in the ages of five to eight, nine to twelve, thirteen plus, um, I do teach on out school. Oh, and I also believe I'm starting a new. Um, uh, um, college prep insect anatomy class for high schoolers. Um, I was requested to do that again, so that class will be up shortly too, which is awesome. Um, keep in mind, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and um, hang out with me a little bit. At Insectopia2015 is my Facebook and my Instagram account, so um, uh, connect with me there if you would like. I uh, respond to comments and all the things, and so have a good time. Um, and this QR code right here is just in case you wanted to don donate to my Insectopia um, PayPal account. Unfortunately, I uh, unfortunately I broke my recent BioQuip black lighting bulb, so I'm going to need to go and buy a new black lighting bulb. Um, and I have I have it to take care of it, but uh, you know sometimes sometimes things get I it was all wrapped up and it was perfectly uh, protected except that it was wrapped up in a blanket and I accidentally tripped and stepped on it. So um, luckily I had an additional one when I was out because I always have backup lights, but I'm definitely gonna want to I'm definitely gonna be replacing that shortly. Um, and as always, feel free to email me. My email is. Uh, Trisha at theinsectopia.com and um, if you have any fun questions or you want to share your sketch with me you can always go ahead and do that there this is what she looks like today I think we did a pretty good job on her there's a there's a couple p parts that I I feel like the head is not exactly right, and so if I was going to continue working, I would probably work on the top of the head here. But other than that, I am actually pretty happy with her. Um, next week, let's see. Woo! Hopefully that stays.
Next week, I should have a really cool Katie did that is, um, that's ready to draw. Oh, I also have a male velvet ant that I just pinned up a couple days ago. So that should be dry, too, by the next time that we are drawing together next week. Um, so that male velvet ant should be pretty nifty. Um, I have a tiger beetle. I wonder what it would look like to put these specimens I wonder if we can see them. Oh, nope. Don't do that. Nope. Can't do it. Um, yeah, so I've got all types of, you know, fun stuff on the board right now. This is just one of the boards, but, you know, things are happening. So I look forward to going through those with you. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week. Feel free to reach out at any time. And stay buggy.